right. Good morning and welcome everyone to documentation and its implication to practice and healthcare system webinar. All right. Thank you, Grace, for the intro and welcome to every care member on the um, platform. It's a pleasure sharing information with you. Um, so the topic again is documentation and its implications to the healthcare system and also to our practice. And I know that a lot of individuals are looking forward to when they hear documentation, everybody thinks about dotting their I's and crossing their T's. But this presentation is not about dotting your I's or crossing your T's or your T's. We are hoping, or I am hoping, to take you to another level as to why you document and what happens when you document especially in the Canadian healthcare system. So our agenda today is very short. Um, I will define documentation, give a brief overview of the different types of documentation that um, we do as nurses in Ontario, some of which you already know, some may be new to you. Implications um, of documentation to our practice, um, which will be demonstrated through a chat form and understand the key reporting requirements for internal and external organizations. Why is it not moving? Can you hear me, Grace? Yes, yeah, try oh. hitting that. Okay, there you yeah. go. <laughs> All right, so documentation is a clear um, and comprehensive and accurate. It's clear, comprehensive and accurate. It's, it is an integral part of um, safe and effective nursing practice. Documentation also provides a record of the judgment and critical thinking used in professional practice and provides an account of the nurse's unique contributions, contribution to healthcare. And that is taken from the CNO um, practice standard on documentation. So if you want to verify, you can go to the CNO practice standard on documentation and see what, how they describe or define documentation. So our various types of documentation, we have our nursing progress notes, which is you know, one of the no notes that all of us write all around the world, our narrative nursing notes, our problem-oriented nursing notes, chatting by exception nursing notes, um, nursing admission assessment, nursing care plans, we have graphic charts, and we have medication administration records. Now, this is just a few of them, the most common ones. Um, you will get an, a document that will explain um, these other, these types of, of documentation. Um, at the end of the presentation. So we're gonna make a connection um, this morning. First of all, after completing, because this presentation is based on the fact that you have understood from the previous presentation from K about documentation, how to dot your I's and cross your T's. So now that you have known or you have knowledge of that, um, for those of you who attended that workshop. Um, now we're gonna make the connection as to after you have completed your documentation, what happens um, to that document? Oh, you can unmute your microphone if you have any comments or you can type it in the chat box. So first you have to know that after you have um, done all of your documentation, there are reporting requirements that um, are covered or that should be done both internally and externally, okay? So the internal reporting requirements include reporting to leadership within the organization, which include, includes um, managers, directors, CEOs, board members, and generally focus on the effectiveness of the organization in broad uh, areas of finance, quality, and patient satisfaction. 
So before all of what you have documented goes outside of the organization, it has to be um, wired through or inside of the organization. And sometimes a simple thing such as reporting to a, a senior nurse um, and also the nurse reporting to HR based on whatever the circumstance is, um, these two are considered internal reporting requirements, okay? Then we have the external reporting requirements um, for both health organizations are uh, extensive and involve much work on the part of the organization. So you as the nurse, you are not in charge of, of that. You are not included in that part. It's just that whatever you have put on this document now will be used to go outside of the organization. And our next slide will um, explain that a little bit more. So some of the external, and for the purpose of this organization, for this um, presentation, we'll be looking at, we'll be focusing more on the external reporting um, organizations and not so much so on the internal. So some of the external reporting organizations is the Canadian Institute of Health Information. Um, some of you might hear of it, some of you may not. Um, then there's the Cancer Care um, Ontario. There's the Ministry of Long-Term um, Care. Um, this one is very common. Um, I'm sure most of you know about the Ministry of Long-Term Care um, due to COVID. And Ontario Health Quality Council. So these are just four of the main organizations that um, your nurses' notes would be sending information to. So let's break it down. You have the nursing care plan and you have the nursing admission assessment. So these are two of the documentations that um, types of documentation that nurses complete on the unit, okay? So let's assume you have dotted your I's and crossed your T's and, and now, um, it is going through the external route of the organization. Let's see what happens. So it goes to the Canadian Institute um, Health Information, that's sci -Hi. What happens, you, you would wonder. Now you realize the, the arrows are not going one way, it's going back and forth. And after I explain the cycle, then you will understand why the arrow is going back and forth and not just one way. So once it goes to um, the Canadian Institute of Health Information, that information now would be used to develop policies, okay? So let's assume, let me just give an example. Let's assume you work on gynecology and or on a maternal unit, gynae, and you have a lot of new moms. Some of your observations about the new moms would have to be something about um, mother-child bonding, um, child, infant and mother bond, bond, bonding, sorry. It would have to do with breastfeeding techniques, um, whether or not the client was frustrated, um, relaxed, and what techniques you probably used um, when assisting the mother with breastfeeding. So whatever information you put in your documentation, um, your interventions, rationals, and rationals for your intervention, the Canadian Health, the, the Canadian Institute of Health Information would use that information to develop policies on what would be necessary for new moms to do um, whilst at the hospital. So whether it be the child um, should get the first breast milk, um, why it is important, and whether or not the unit would give formula to babies and or why the mom should maybe breast, pump the breast milk in order to allow the child to use um, the colostrum from that breast milk rather than using formula. So that could be one of the policies 
that are developed. You could be working on um, a med surge unit and there are bed sores. And because of the techniques that you use or you realize the beds are the issues, when that information goes to the Institute of Health um, Information, they can develop a policy that um, they should use earthquake bed beds um, for the clients to reduce on the number of um, bed sores that they're having. Okay, so we're moving on to the next. And then we have research. So with um, policy development, you can also have research being done to see which one of these beds would be the best and why breastfeeding would be best for babies as opposed to um, bottle feeding, okay? So let's look at the circle on the other end. So you have your nursing care plan, your health, and your um, nursing um, admission assessment. The information can be sent to the Cancer Care um, Ontario. And that information can also be used either for research or policy development or policies can be um, developed. So programs in the community such as um, immunization for um, the children, the kids, infant, um, programs such as breastfeeding programs, um, um, settlement programs. It might not be directly related to um, medicine, but it can inform other sectors in the healthcare system, such as housing, um, things such as programs for youth within the community. So your, your documentation goes very far and I'm sure um, this morning, I'm hoping this morning that I will, every time you put pen to paper, this presentation will make you realize how valuable your documentation is, not only to the client that you are caring for, but also to the wider community and also within the healthcare system, okay? Any questions so far before I move on from this cycle? No. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. If you want to write the cycle down to remind yourself, you can do that. So external reporting requirements, um, that will be provided in the handout um, that Grace will um, send to you after the presentation. So the Canadian Health Information, um, Institute of Health Information. So the data collected must be accurate and timely, dated to help establish policy management manage, sorry, manage the Canadian healthcare system and to raise public awareness. The reported data helps to develop policy and provide guidance in managing the health care system as a whole. So um, SciHi also reports on the health indicators of Canadians by socioeconomic status and demographic factors. So if you didn't know the role of the Canadian Institute of Health Information, that is the major role. And they, as you can see, they do not only look at health um, problems in and of itself, but how it can also affect the social aspect of individuals, social and economic aspects. So the Canadian Cancer, um, Can Cancer Care Ontario, this organization houses the Ontario Renal Network and the Ontario Government um, Access to Care Program. So um, if you are working on a renal unit, you will be very familiar with the Cancer Care Ontario um, organization because part of your documentation um, would be informing or providing information to that specific organization and it supports the province's wait time strategy, meaning how long you wait to see a specialist or how long you wait at the emergency room, um, these different wait, wait times. 
which includes data around surgical wait times as well as ALC or alternative level of care, um, which enables improvements in the access, quality, and if efficiency of healthcare services, efficacy, sorry, of healthcare services. So basically when you have individuals at the um, hospital or rehab unit waiting to be discharged to um, a specific area or someone waiting for hospice, hospice care, um, Cancer Care Ontario is the one in charge of looking at how long in the system, the individual would have to wait to get that, um, to receive that service. So Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, I know a lot of us have heard this one. So this Ministry of Health requires financial data to determine overall budget allocations to individual organizations, as well as provincial health budget distribution. The organizations are required to submit financial data and patient volumes. And you'll probably ask yourself, wait, wait, this is money. Why, why do I have to, um, what, what does that have to do with me? Let's go back to you on the unit um, with financial data. Anytime you apply for a job, the employer will say, can you work with limited resources? and so on and so forth. So you using your critical thinking judgment skills to manage the resources that you have on the unit is you contributing towards um, identifying how much money this unit would need in order to run if efficiently or effectively. So do not consider any of your actions as um, being isolated, but every action that we perform on the unit contributes towards the wider system or the healthcare system in and of itself. So quality improvement is another source of data submission required, including organizations' quality improvement plans, patient safety and quality improvement, such as hand washing compliance and nosocomial infection rates. Now this is at the broad level. So what is your role? Um, um, in that section. So let's just say you are on the unit, um, of course, washing your hands would be an important aspect. And we know that some of the organizations, they have individuals who monitor in, um, persons um, who are washing or not washing their hands um, at all. And that is documented and sent to um, the ministry for for, to Chai Hai, who would give the statistics and the, then inform um, Ministry of Long-Term Care. Um, then it says that also for in, um, quality improvement, what is your role in quality improvement as a nurse on the unit? So some of the things that we do on the unit, such as workshops or team meetings or interprofessional healthcare meetings, it is also for um, quality improvement. It's a plan for improving um, care on the unit to both clients and if it is for um, strengthening staff knowledge. And one of the tools that um, we use in order to contribute towards quality improvement care is our learning plan. And um, some of you may or may not um, know what it is, but it is one of the tools that we use to identify issues that are around us during our practice. And we do some research and come up with some solutions as to how to address um, the problem. So you doing that is also contributing towards the um, quality improvement um, plan of the organization, however, once you have provided this um, knowledge or skill, it can be knowledge, could be skill, then the nurses now would go out and execute, document their findings. And that in turn goes back to that entire circle that I explained earlier, where improvement will be done system-wise. And this is not just one organization. 
So because nurses work in various sectors, all of these organizing, um, all of the various sectors or various sections in nursing institutions sends this documentation to these external organizations where it is analyzed and is given a bigger picture, okay? It's let out as a bigger picture. So the Ontario Health Quality Council, it promotes health care that is supported by the best scientific evidence by making recommendations to health organizations and standards of care and to the Ministry of, of Health for health care services. Okay, so this is the um, organization, the Ontario Health Quality Council. Their responsibility is to provide scientific evidence. So whatever it is you document must be true, must be timely, must be accurate, because the more accurate your documentation is, is um, it strengthens the Ontario Health Care Quality Council feedback um, by providing the scientific data to back up what you have documented. And we know that um, our work is based on um, evidence-based practice, okay? So what are the implications of documentation to practice? So you have now understood that when you document and you have done all your dottings of your I's and crossing your T's, this information does not remain at the hospital. It's, it's circulated within the hospital. However, it is um, sent out for further research and policy development and all of that. So now that this is done, you want to know how does um, the work that is done at Ministry of Long-Term Care or um, Cancer Care, how does it affect my practice? What, how important is um, the information they provide to me as a nurse? So number one, it guides program planning. And I explained it a little bit earlier when I um, talked about breastfeeding programs or settlement programs, housing, um, vaccination um, um, clinics, uh, what else? Mental health programs for newcomers, um, a lot of other things apart from, I want you to look outside of the box. It's not just about wound care, um, IV, um, infection prevention, or medication errors. I want you to look at it at a broader um, point of view where this documentation, yes, it's true, you're looking at um, the pregnant mother um, breastfeeding. However, there is a mental, uh, 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 um, mental part or psychological part of what's happening to this client at the hospital. And whatever you document here would go further into developing maybe a mental health programs for new mothers, okay? So it guides program planning. It also um, brings up ideas for research. So for those of us um, as nurses who enjoy research and bringing new, um, things to the profession, new thoughts and thinking and information, research is, is the way to go. And in research, there's qualitative and quantitative. So if you are qualitative nurse or quantitative nurse, um, I'm sure you will enjoy reading those articles that comes about with um, the information that would guide your practice or would guide the, um, the way in which you run a program in a, on a unit or in an institution. And it also um, provides quality improvement. So I remembered when I um, came into nursing, um, I was taught to do a dressing from um, outside in. And then a couple of years later, maybe like two or three years later, I was reading an article and they said outside in is not the way to go. It's inside out because inside is considered the, the cleanest and outside is the dirtiest. 
So that's just a simple example of quality improvement research done that would guide our practice as to changing the way we do things, okay? Or it could be using a, something such as a push-pause method to identify whether or not the cannula um, is inside of the vein when put in an IV, okay? Um, and that would be to avoid putting um, saline into the inter interstitial space. It's as simple as that. But your documentation in what happens after you put up an IV would depend on how um, the organizations now use this information to now um, carry out research to improve your practice or quality assurance. Okay, so in summary, um, it can be used, and when I say it, I mean documentation. It can be used to evaluate professional practice as part of quality improvement um, process. It can be used to determine the care of um, services a client required or required or that were provided. Nurses can review outcome information to reflect on their practice and identify knowledge gaps that can form the basis of learning plans. So again, it goes back to you as the nurse identifying. So when we are working, it's not just about giving a client medication or just going, we run into the tides, that you're just doing the procedure because you know that's the right thing. Well, whilst you're doing it, why am I doing it? Um, what can I do to improve um, this client, the care for this client? Um, and even looking further as to um, if I do it correctly, how would that affect quality assurance or how would that affect in the future the programs that would be um, developed for client care? And in nursing research, documentation is used to assess nursing intervention and evaluate client outcome, identify care and documentation issues and advance evidence-based practice. So I have this short video, I hope that it, it plays this morning. I know sometimes um, the technology lets us down. I would like everyone to just sit back Take notes, listen to it because it's a very informative, it summarizes what I um it summarizes what I have been explaining. So I'm going to play it right now. Let me know if you can hear what. Can you hear Grace? No. Oh, why is that? Um, it's important that they hear. Can you hear Grace? No, not yet. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop it and I'm yeah. going to see if I can um, just give me a second, okay? Because this is so when you share your screen, uh, try sharing the audio as well. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe I should send it to you. Yeah, you could do that as well. I just realized I, I sent you the first one, but I didn't send you. This one, okay. This one, I'm sorry about that. Sure. Bear patience with me, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Um, one second, Grace. Oops. If anyone has a question, just type it in the chat box or if you have any comments. Um, yeah, now is the time to ask your question. Yeah. Feel free to unmute your microphone. Okay, great. Um, I sent it. All right. Mm 
Okay. So maybe you can share it for me, Grace. Which one? Oh, the, the link? The, the link. I don't okay. know why. Because I put on the volume and it was not uh, playing. Okay, I will. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Are you at the very last? Oh, okay, I found it. Number 15. Just give me a sec. Everybody see my screen? Sorry. Share sound. Is this the one you're trying to share? Yeah, this is the one. Open it down here at the bottom. Okay. At the bottom. Yeah. <clears throat> give me a second. It's a red question mark. Everybody hear it? Yes. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Simpson. Every day we hear and read reports about the quality of care being delivered to Canadians. Sometimes they tell us that things are in good shape, while other times we're told healthcare outcomes need improving. Have you ever wondered what your role as a clinician is in how health information gets collected, analyzed and reported? Well, it all starts with the patient chart. When you see a patient, you're gathering information about symptoms, medical history, and pre-existing conditions. You're also ordering tests and making diagnoses. All of this information is used to inform how care is delivered, to drive quality improvement, and to support better patient care and health outcomes. And did you know that the patient chart information that you collect and document is the foundation that helps measure the performance of our health systems? Let's dig a little deeper into how this works. When a patient is discharged from hospital, much of the information you documented in their chart gets coded using systems called the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD, and the Canadian Classification of Health Interventions, or CCI. ICD and CCI are common language tools used to classify and code diagnoses, symptoms, and procedures. The Canadian Institute for Health Information, or CAIHI, maintains these systems in Canada. CAIHI uses these codes, along with other information from the patient's chart, to provide comparable and actionable data so that healthcare providers and organizations like yours can measure and improve the way we deliver healthcare in Canada. As clinicians, we all know that recording details in patients' charts takes time. So how comprehensive does this information need to be for it to be useful down the line? Let's look at an example. Meet Larry. He was admitted to hospital for a hip replacement. His medical history indicates that he has type 1 diabetes. While in hospital, he develops pneumonia. So you add the following notes to the discharge summary in his chart. After Larry is discharged, your hospital's health records team assigns ICD and CCI codes based on what you documented. The more detail you include in Larry's discharge summary, the richer this information will be. Larry's record, along with hundreds of thousands of others, will be used in developing indicators that help monitor outcomes. Because you noted the bacteria were resistant to the antibiotic methicillin, Larry's record will be included in the calculation of indicators like in-hospital infections and other patient safety measures. This also affects the calculation of things like the expected length of stay and total cost, which would have been different than if you hadn't included this piece of information. And because you noted that Larry has type 1 diabetes, we now have important patient risk information that will be taken into account for indicator calculations and comparisons. 
In turn, these indicators can help you manage the care you deliver to patients. So what's the prescription for a comprehensive patient chart? Specificity about diagnoses, examination findings, comorbidities, discharge information, and so on. Don't leave anything out. Watch for missing, incomplete, or conflicting information. Now you can see how high quality chart documentation results in high quality data. This means we can all have confidence in the information we use to support quality improvement and ultimately in understanding how our health systems are performing, helping us as clinicians deliver the best care to our patients. Yes, okay. There you go. Okay, thank you so much, Grace. Um, I'm hoping that this the summary of this clip really puts everything into perspective for you as a clinician or nurse um uh healthcare provider, and also the presentation that I made with regards to um I see your hand is up with regards to how um this information that you are putting on paper, it is not only to safeguard your license. I know a lot of people look at it as, oh, I need to put this because I need to safeguard my license, okay? If you look at the importance, if you focus more on the importance of why you document and what you document, I do not think that you would be focusing or it would be important to safeguard your license because you'll be doing the right thing. Um, I think Anne had a question. I'll take Anne's question before I move on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> short okay, back. Anne. <laughs> by mistake. Okay. Okay, Anne, no problem. Um, anybody else has any questions before I move on? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so, well, my next slide was actually questions. Um, and I, Grace, do we have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat box. Okay, so I'm going to move on to my next slide. So if you, if you need to read the articles that um, I used um, to get all of that information, um, please send an email to me or to Grace. And I can always send you this, um, the article. Um, Grace, at the end of the program, I'm going to get a, a PDF copy of the articles so that if any client calls you for them, you can always share the article with them, okay? okay. Um, also, um, Grace, when you are sending the document sheet, please share with them the video, the link for the video because oh, it has, okay the roles of the other organizations that are involved externally in um, documentation. Okay. Okay. Right. So these are the references. Um, I had a, a survey monkey for evaluation, but Grace has one. Grace is gonna share theirs. Um, I would like to say thank you to all of you. Um, who attended the workshop today. I do hope that if not everything, but at least one thing remains with you at the end of this workshop. And I'm hoping to get questions now that the workshop is over. That tells me people were listening and that they understood. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, I, yeah, I will type in my email address so you could um, have it there, Milena. But Feel free to unmute your microphones um, if you have any questions. Survey <clears throat> Monkey link is also there now in the chat box, so you can complete that as well. Um, I have a question actually. This is Anne. It's not a mistake, right, Anne? Yeah, this is not a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm listening. So I've been I've been out of practice for a very long time, 
And I'd like to see if you have any copies of um, like the normal, like the daily documentation um, like forms. If you have, I'd just like to see how it looks like now, nowadays. Um, when you say the documentation form, you mean like the nursing progress notes, what does it look like? Yeah, and all the forms that are to be filled in a daily basis. If, okay, so, if it's sorry, possible. if it's possible. So the answer to your question is no, we do not have um, these forms or documentation um, because this belongs blank, to the blank. hospitals, oh, right? Okay. And it's not something that should be shared outside of the hospital setting. However, what I can advise is that you attend the doc, the first part, because there's a first part of this documentation presentation where they actually tell you what to do, how to um, document, where to document. And this presenter, it's not me, it's someone else. Um, she has um, samples that you can look and see how um, to make corrections or if you are putting a late entry, how to put it in. So I highly recommend that you do that. Another recommendation would be to um, apply for virtual mentoring, mm -hmm. okay? Virtual mentoring, you will actually get to meet a nurse from one of the um, healthcare organizations that you can ask questions with regards to that. And I know they will be very happy to assist you. So I'm recommending two things for you, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so, it, so it's already um, ongoing, the virtual mentoring. I thought it's uh, it's not happening. It is, is it? virtual mentoring is happening because you do not have to go into the organization. It's virtual online and you book your appointment, your meeting dates with your nurse where you can discuss with her things that you are not comfortable with. Um, things that you'd like to know, and they are more than happy to help. Okay, and I have, I have another question. Although yeah. it's um, um, outside of documentation, but it's still nursing regarding nursing. So I I understand that care is offering like the safe practice um, renewals with, and it it includes the. Um, like the language proficiency in it. If you pass it, you will be good with, a, with those requirements. Do you still um, offer them? Okay, and when it comes to the specific programs for care and whether or not you are eligible for it, my instructions to you is to speak with your case manager. So okay. you send your case manager um, an email to let her know that you're interested in virtual mentoring. Yes, it is ongoing, but you must speak with your case manager so that yeah. you can get application forms and instructions as to how to apply. In regards to our safe practice program, again, you must go through your case manager. All right, thank you so much, Natalina. You're welcome, Anne. Anybody else has any questions? Is there any question in the chat? Like to me, I saw someone saying, asking a question. Yeah, so they were just asking about the virtual mentoring and I think you answered it, Natalina. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, Megan has a question. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. question. Go ahead. I have a comment. Um, <laughs> oh, Megan has comments. a question. Go ahead. <laughs> the nun <laughs> So everyone, this is my colleague, Megan, by the way. Hello. Yes. <laughs> the past program. Um, yeah. 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 We've got some past folks here. I'm so glad. Yes. Oh, you have. Okay, great, great. So Many of them, good. actually. Yeah. <laughs> So a lot of the past folks have this already, but I have the um, documentation practice um, exercises that are that Cara, our Salban instructor, everyone had given me to share. Do you want me to put the link in the chat box? Yes, yes sure, please. of course. Yes, it's, it's yes, awesome. of course. Uh, yes. Because in order to really um, appreciate this presentation, 
one has to understand your role in documentation first. And once you have a good grasp as to what your role is in documentation, then you can understand how your um, you documenting applies to our healthcare system, as the as the doctor rightly said in the press in the video. Um, Natalina, another yes, question. Go you, ahead. you mentioned about the documentation, the first part. Um, how do we? How do I uh, know about it, or how do okay. I? Okay, so what you need to do is to contact your case manager. Um, the documentation workshop, once it is dated, um, the case manager would have a flyer with how to register and everything. They would um, send it to you via email and you would register for the, for the workshop All online, right. okay? So again, I know you hearing me saying, go to your case manager, go to your case manager. And it is because the case manager is your source of information for you and will give you information that is specific to your needs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Anne. Any other questions? We have 10 minutes left. I do not want to um, end the meeting and people feel that, oh, I had this burning question. If you do not want to ask, you can type it in the chat. That's fine. I'll be more than happy to. Um, Natalina, I have another Hi, question. Anne again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I, I do believe that when you document, it's, it should be on time. Should it be like when you do something, you document it right away? Or do you finish your shift before you document everything? It's always wise to document as you go. Okay, so you complete a, a procedure, you give the client medication at 10, don't try to document that you give it at um, 11, 12 o'clock. You may forget it, you may miss it, you may document the time at the wrong place in the wrong slot, you may put 12, 10 a.m. med slot in the 12 um, noon slot, you know, you, to avoid a lot of confusion and errors. Mm -hmm. Um, it is wise to document as you go. Um, realistically, sometimes it's very difficult to do so, but the, the practice is to do it as soon as possible. Yeah. And do you uh, have any um, like workshops on time management? Like how, do you, how does um, like a good nurse does her documentation or does her whole shift I just want to know if there's something like that because um, if because I'm an international internationally educated nurse and we do different things back in my country, but uh, here I'd like to see how they do it. So I have a guide. Mm -hmm. And okay. that's that's one that's a wonderful question, and that question takes me directly to virtual mentoring. If you want to know what the life, what it is to be a nurse on a unit, any unit, or at working at any institution, to follow through with the daily routine, virtual mentoring is your answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Because remember, once you are assigned a mentor, you have access to that person in a way that allows you to ask any question that you like. Mm -hmm. So I could answer that question because I've been in the clinical area, but when you have that mentor that could really that objective um, response from that individual, I, I highly recommend that you, 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 you look like a prime candidate for virtual mentoring. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I advise that as soon as this is done, get to your case manager. I'm not sure who is your case manager, but get, it could be me and I don't know, but it's nearby. Your, <laughs> it's nearby. Okay, perfect. He's the perfect, he's, he's okay. So send nearby an email. I'm sure he will respond to you right away um, when, he's, when, he, when he's back into the office. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. 
Melan Milana Milena. Did I pronounce I, that correctly? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, when it comes to medical record, are all hospitals in Canada uh, connected? I mean, can a nurse or physician retrieve a medical record of a patient who in the past went to a um, different hospital? Now, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> that's an excellent question. Actually, um, I found out that not all medication records are connected. You can go to, let's say, Mount Sinai and get an antibiotic, a specific antibiotic, and then go to Humber Hospital, and they cannot see that you actually receive this antibiotic because they are using different record systems. I think um, that's one of the flaws in the healthcare system that not everything um, is, the goal is to get everything to be connected. So no matter where you go, the ideal outlook is that they see everything about you, but it is not so. Only some information can be retrieved um, any and everywhere because I'll give you a simple example. Your immunization record can only be found from um, at your um, physician's office or if you have a medical family physician. If you go to the hospital, the hospital cannot identify whether or not you have, you have been fully immunized. When we're talking about the measles, mumps, rubella, so, so on and so forth, okay? You would have to get a report from your medical doctor to be sent to the hospital mm -hmm to show proof that you are fully immunized. That's that is simple, but that's just an example to show you that not all of them are connected. Although okay. that was, that is the aim, the ideal thing is that it should be that, but it's not. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. You're welcome. Hi, Natalina, this is Ajibnesh. Hi. I have a uh, I, have, I have case manager still I can uh, uh, have a mentor right virtual and what the difference okay your case manager is the one who guides you through your registration process so when whatever you need during your process your case manager will be the one to develop that action plan so that you can meet your goal for registration as RNO RPN your mentor at the hospital for virtual mentoring is to prepare you for employment, give you information that would um, enhance the knowledge that you already have and give you new knowledge because you have never worked in the Ontario healthcare system. Okay, that's the big difference. Oh. The person who's your mentor is only there for a short while, maybe like a month or so, I think, um, the virtual mentoring is for about a month. But your case manager is there a lifetime. Okay, Excuse thank me. you. Excuse okay. me. Hi, yes. Good morning. Yeah, good thank morning. you very much for your for your informative presentation. I I just am very interested uh, some of the attendance has put um, a question in the, in the chat box. His name is Gerald. He's asking about the documentation. Do you, do you actually uh, inform the patients that his information is going to be shared for those uh, organizations that is stated in the video? Or you also you mentioned that. This, was his, this is his question. It is now lay, it is in the chat box. I'm interested to know the answer, please. Okay, let me let me see if I can find Grace. Can you help his me? Name, yeah, his, his name is Gerald. Actually, um, Gerald was about to unmute his microphone. We were just chatting as well. Um, but okay. thank you, Samia. But go ahead, Gerald. Ask away. Yeah, ask your question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead, Gerald. I think this is Gerald's question. Yeah, no, it, no, the questions are not missed. They're monitored, so don't worry about the questions there in the chat box. So I just want to ask or clarify if. Um, since we're going to share all the information or the documentation to other organizations, um, do we need to inform the patients prior to, you know, doing all that? Good question. Um, yeah. if, you read, if you read your standards of practice um, for nurses underneath, 
I think it is informed consent, consent, consent. If you read the consent, it, you well, part of um, the nurse's role is to inform the client that whatever information that they share um, will be held confidential. However, it will be shared among staff and organizations that are related to the care. So it's not something where the information will be given to any and every organization, right? Um, let's say for example, the client come, I'll give you an example just to clarify um, a little bit more. Let's say you're working in a endoscopy clinic and part of your role is to um, label and um, collect samples from the client, right? So you would, you as the nurse would label the sample, make sure that the client's name, age and everything, dot your I's and cross your T's. Would that sample remain within your organization? No, it goes to the lab. That's an outside, right? Now, would the lab keep all of the information to themselves? No, they send it back to your medical doctor who would talk to you as to, or the client, sorry, who would talk to the client as to whether or not um, the lymph, the node that was um, extracted was um, cancerous or not. But would the lab remain with that information? No, they send it to Cancer Care Society because they are the ones that put this information together to see whether we have an, an increase in cancer or decrease in the number of cancers. So all of these organizations would not get that specific information from the client, but Cancer Care is directly related to the procedure that was performed. And so it will be shared with cancer care. Now, if there is an increase in cancer, Ministry of Long-Term Care need to come in because they provide the finance um, to provide quality assurance programs and so on and so forth, so that we can have maybe campaigns or, or programs to decrease on a specific cancer that is on the rise or to increase awareness of. So it is not that you are telling the client, oh, your information will be sent to WHO and da, 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 da. No, you're gonna tell the client that, and if you read the standard, I would like everyone to go back and read that standard, okay? Um, consent, underneath consent, sharing and giving information to clients. Whatever we, whatever I do today is confidential. However, there are some things that I would need to share with the team and some organizations that are related to your care. That is a very important statement to make. Got it? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mil 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 Milena, do you have a question? Your hands is up. Oh, no, no, I don't have a question. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions, Grace, from the chat box? Uh, no, I don't see any more questions. Um, in the chat box, I see a lot of thank yous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. You're welcome, guys. Any other question? Now is the time to speak, especially those of you who are going for the safe practice program. It's very important that you understand why you're documenting and what you are documenting and what happens to that documentation. As I said um, earlier on, the um, more you appreciate why you document, I think the more thorough you will be with um, documentation and contribute towards um, developing or improving our healthcare system. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, there's a question in the chat box, Natalina. Should I um is it like, breaking the rule of confidentiality when you use your client's information as an example in health discussions like the one we are having now, um, without mentioning the patient's name? Um, which one we are having now? Because I don't I do not even know of any client. Um, I, I was not even um I don't know who was thinking of anything, but I wasn't even thinking of any clients. <laughs> so 
not sure what you're trying to ask because the example I gave was just based on not, thank you, this was great, okay. Um, Zini, I think Zini was asking, is it breaking the rule of confidentiality when you use your client's information as an example in the discussion? No, it I was think not it's a sharing case studies, right? Because yeah, yeah, that, that doesn't seem against the rules if there's no identifying information. Yeah, there's no, there's absolutely no identifying information. Um, yeah, so that's not sharing. Sharing the client's information is actually saying that Megan was um, at Sunnybrook Hospital. She had, um, what can I say? <laughs> Simple. She had antibiotics given. <laughs> and can you believe it? And even if you don't know Megan, but the mere fact that I mentioned Megan and she had IV antibiotics mm. given um, at Sunnybrook, or you're in an elevator and you're talking to someone from your unit, from your unit, same unit, and you're saying, oh, um, I had a client today and I gave her pain medication and she was asking for more. That is breaking confidentiality because you are actually talking about your client from the unit with another nurse that was not assigned to your client. But giving an example as to you working at an endoscopy clinic and your role is to take samples, um, which is something that is a role of a nurse at an endoscopy clinic and that you have documented properly and that the client information um, will be sent to the lab and the lab will send it to, that's just giving an, an example of how, what the case study will look like. And actually the documentation um, document that I'll be sharing with you, it has lots of case studies, which is legal to share. Um, it is from RNAO. Um, so that if that answers your question, um, Ezzini, I hope I pronounce your name um, correctly. Yes, it um, does. Yeah, I was actually asking, like, uh, if you're having a health discussion with maybe your colleagues who are from another unit or maybe from another department, mm -hmm. and you're kind of trying to clear something, and you use your client's information without mentioning their names to ask the question. Or you can say like, I have one client who has this, that, that, uh, is it okay to do this? Something like that. So that's it's what I'm asking. Okay. So it's okay to do that if, if the client gives you permission to do so, number one. And number two, if it is done within professional practice setting, in a sense that it is an interprofessional meeting or it is a group of nurses on a unit trying to find out how to improve care for this client. So you're consulting with your coworkers to find out what can I do to improve care for my client. So that, that's different because it, it's, it's within that, that box of you know, professional practice. But to say you're standing in an elevator, oh my God, I had a long day, this client is complaining all day. And that is not professional. That's not what um, we are supposed to do. Because in any case, having issues on the unit with your clients, you may need to consult with your manager, who is someone who's probably more experienced and can get other resources for you to care for your client um, more efficiently. So you go in and say to the manager, hey, this client didn't sleep well last night and I need some more pain medication for this client. And she may bring a suggestion, you know what, call Dr. So-and-so and have him increase the dose. That's sharing the client's information, but it is within the team to improve care for the client. And the other document I would like you to read, everyone, is the therapeutic nurse client relationship. This has a lot of information as to what you can and cannot share with your client, okay? And how to speak to your client when interacting with the client with regards to information sharing. Also, we have um, 
is it Jaco? How do you call the, the the abbreviation? I can't remember the abbreviation, but um, the Healthcare Act. Um, that's another um, document that you can read to increase your knowledge on what it is that you do when documenting or even in your verbal reporting to the client and to other healthcare professionals. Milena's uh, hand raised. Milena, do you have a question? It no, sorry, I don't have a question. So I don't know. Uh, sorry, no. <laughs> okay. Gerald, do you have a question? Yeah. What if uh, the client refused to um, to divulge or to share the information? So what will happen? Well, if the client um, tells you, I'm assuming that you mean that the client tells you but doesn't want you to tell others. Yeah, if yeah. you go back to the same document that I, I spoke about in the standards of practice, the there is a point that says, whatever you say will be kept confidential. However, I need to share certain information with other members of the healthcare team, right? So that other information, if that information that the client gave you is something that will harm or that may cause harm to the client, if not shared, then you, you have to report it. For example, the client is saying, the client is six, I'm just giving you an age, maybe not a very good example, but the client is saying, my, my uncle is abusing me, whether it be physically, verbally, sexually, or let's say physical. And you can actually see the physical signs with all of the marks on the child's skin. And the child has come to your clinic for um, care several times. And you're observing that being, like it's a repeated thing. You can see that the, the um, signs of physical abuse are there. Would you keep that information? Because the child says, I don't want you to share. According to the child, the child act, or even, even an adult, you will have to report it. You will have to put it on documentation that it is happening. Yes. You're aware of that, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's advocacy, right? That's correct. Although the client is saying no, but you know that if you do not, indicate that then the client can die you can you know the person the, the abuser can kill the child so that's just that's just some of the and and that's the ethical dilemma and you can read the documents on the document on ethics which is one of my favorite um, standards of practice um you can read that too because you will in your documentation see things or hear things from your client that you feel Mm, the client says, no, should I? But look at, if you read the ethic, um, the document on ethics, you will see that there are things that even if the client does not want it to be shared, it has to be shared. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great question, great question. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay until 11.15, okay? Um, hoping that others who are shy would come out of their shells, whether they type or they speak. And at 11.15, I'll wrap it up. So yeah. two more minutes. I don't see anything in the chat box, just many thank yous to, for a great presentation. So good. And, and whilst everybody's thinking about the question, the document that, um, grace will be sending it's a legal document it is actually cases that have been brought to court and the lawyer from rnao is actually explaining in each case why this nurse was brought up in the courthouse um, i highly recommend you take the time to read each case and before you look at his response I would like you to try to figure out why this person would be brought to court. Some things you already know, but others, I mean, I'm sure that um, it's something new to you. Very nice document, very easy to read. It's on a PowerPoint slide kind of, it's very informative. 
Hence the reason why I'm sharing it. So we have one minute left, ladies and gents. Um, I enjoy sharing this information with you and I hope that it, was ben it will be beneficial to your future practice and to your present practice. Um, thank you so much for attending. And those of you who have not done the part A in documentation, please go back to part A so that you can have a, a greater appreciation for this part, which is part B. And virtual mentoring guys, very helpful. Join, sign up as soon as possible.